Chances are you've heard of oxytocin before, mainly because of stories like this. Oxytocin is sometimes called the cuddle hormone. Thanks very much. Uh, here you go. I'll give you one back. Here's your prescription from Dr. Love. Eight hugs a day. But none of these things are exactly true. In our quest to simplify things, the story of oxytocin has been muddled and mixed up so much it's full of misconceptions. And it's gotten so out of hand, you can even buy oxytocin spray for an unsubstantiated spritz of love and trust. So if you're wondering, how did we get to this point and what does oxytocin actually do? You're in the right place. We are going to get to the bottom of the science of oxytocin because everything you've heard about oxytocin is probably wrong. Part of this video is sponsored by Wondrium. Get your free trial at wondrium.com slash braincraft. This is what you've probably heard about oxytocin. That it is a cuddle chemical or a hug hormone and that if you were to hug your partner, that is one surefire way to release oxytocin. And uh, it's, that might not necessarily be true. Okay, so Dan is an oxytocin researcher. My name is Dan Quintana, and I'm a senior researcher at the University of Oslo in the Department of Psychology. As an expert? I've been researching oxytocin now for over a decade. Dan is also an internet myth buster. And this is the most persistent myth that you can quickly boost your levels of oxytocin by scratching your dog, hugging a pillow, or even a goat. And you'll feel good. So to understand why this is not necessarily the case, we need to go back to basics with oxytocin. It's really interesting in that it operates both as a hormone and a neurotransmitter. So a neurotransmitter typically communicates from cell to cell within the brain, whereas a hormone is produced in one area of the body and it is released into the bloodstream typically, and it acts at, in different parts of the body. Oxytocin is special because it does both. Oxytocin it was first discovered in the early 1900s when researchers figured out that it played an important role in childbirth by contracting the uterus and then in breastfeeding. But that's not actually where the hug hormone idea came from. It all started with goats. In the 1970s, researchers at the time suspected that oxytocin might also contribute to this bond between the mother goat and the child. But why goats? Do you think that goats are a bit random? The bond between um, mother and child in goats is a lot when it comes to odour. They are very good at identifying, like even within a large herd of goats, they can identify by a smell who their offspring are. So since it was discovered that oxytocin contributed to the smelly doe kid goat bond, researchers started to look at the social side of oxytocin in human and animal studies, including one 1988 study in rats. Which was looking at this role of oxytocin within touch. And this study found that touch seemed to release oxytocin in rats. But it wasn't a hug or even a cuddle, it was a pinch. A nice pitch. When we actually pinch rats experimentally, done in a nice way at least, this seems to release oxytocin. And then people sort of took this and ran with it and were going, oh wow, this is this is what we need to do. And somehow pinching turned into cuddling and turned into hugging. How this happened is hard to say, but I did find this reference to oxytocin and hugging in a 1994 magazine article, which referenced a book, which referenced a bunch of late 80s and early 90s psychology textbooks I didn't have access to, in which somewhere a pinch became a cuddle. And then specifically... A hug for seven seconds or for five seconds, some indeterminate amount of time. I think this whole cuddle thing comes down to the fact that we, we make this link between the maternal aspects of oxytocin, between breastfeeding, between childbirth and these animal studies linking how mother and child bond. The story is actually quite complicated in that it might release oxytocin, but the levels might be so small that it doesn't really make much of a difference there. And the story is complicated. There are a fair few articles on oxytocin and hugging, even with people hugging their pets. But the way that oxytocin is measured can't always tell us that much. Typically in that kind of research, what we're doing is we're measuring levels of oxytocin either in saliva or in blood. But what's important to remember is that this release of oxytocin into the blood can often be independent for oxytocin release in the brain. So any effects that we're seeing in the blood could only just be just a physical reaction to being touched. It may not necessarily have any effects on our brain physiology or on our thoughts and feelings. So we can't really say, well, it's affecting our behavior or it's affecting our brain. Just to be clear, I'm pro hug and please don't stop hugging your dog. But the evidence is mixed on the levels of oxytocin in humans after the hug. 
Sometimes it rises, sometimes it falls, but that may not even matter. It's not clear if we even notice those levels changing in our brains or bodies. Within our experiments, we typically ask our participants, my lab and other labs typically ask our participants, do you think you got the oxytocin or you got a placebo spray? And people cannot guess beyond chance. There is no feeling that you get with oxytocin. I think it's interesting that so people are trying to sell oxytocin online in an effort to go, this, this is a hormone which is going to make you feel great. I've seen people have thrown oxytocin parties where they either buy oxytocin online, which I would not recommend, or they go around hugging each other, which is cool. I think, you know, everyone can do with a hug. Whether it releases oxytocin is a different story. But they have these oxytocin parties in, in, in an effort to increase their mood. But oxytocin does not operate like that. It is not like, you know, if you were to give someone a typical dose of ecstasy, you know you've gotten ecstasy. But if you were to give someone a typical dose of oxytocin, you cannot guess beyond chance. It doesn't give you a feeling. But despite this, you can pay $29.95 for a two-week supply of oxytocin to spritz onto your skin. As well as the pinch hitting the mainstream, so have the findings from another 2005 study about oxytocin and trust. This was done in a low number of participants, they played an economic game. And this economic game provides a measure of trust. It wasn't a case of asking people, do you trust this person? This was an economic game which measures trusting behaviors. Within this study, they found compared to placebo that oxytocin increases trusting behaviors. Now, the original study received a lot of media attention, but since then, other researchers have struggled to replicate these findings. There was one that came out about two years ago which had hundreds of participants compared to the 20 or 30 they originally had. And they tried to replicate it. They ran the experiment in exactly the same way. They even had some of the authors from the original experiment and they did not find the same effect. But what was interesting was that they did some exploratory analysis and they found that people who had lower dispositional trust or people who didn't sort of trust other people as, as a personality trait, they, were, they actually did find effects on oxytocin. So it seems that maybe it has an effect on trust. It isn't just a fact of you can give it to anyone and you're instantly going to trust other people. Perhaps it may have some effects for people who, for some reason or other, are not trusting of other people. But that's science. We have an hypothesis. We, we don't find what we find. We do some exploratory stuff. And this helps guide future research. Oxytocin is way more complicated than we originally thought. It is a mother-child bonding hormone, but it can also be a defend-your-own-child-at-all-costs hormone. And this extends beyond motherhood and animals. I have heard people suggest that we should drop oxytocin oxytocin bombs into war zones in order to make the opposing sides make up. Uh, that is a terrible idea, even if it were to work. Oxytocin is interesting because not only does it actually increase bonds between your in-group, your friends, the people you identify with, it actually antagonizes you against the out-group and it makes you treat the other people a lot worse. So if we were to drop oxytocin bombs into war zones, it'd actually make things a lot worse. It wouldn't bring peace, it would, bring, it would just bring more conflict. Oxytocin can't be simplified into something that's all good, like a love or happy hormone. It's sophisticated and it leads it to lots of other behaviors as well. For a long time, we thought that oxytocin was this positive pro-social hormone. Then there was one study which found out that oxytocin increases schadenfreude. I'm sorry to anyone who's German speaking who just heard me say that. That is getting pleasure from seeing the misfortune of others. One way to think of it is it's kind of like a boat and a motor in that oxytocin provides the, pr provides the motion, but the rudder actually provides the direction. So it may be positive or it may be negative. Like a lot of areas of science, we need more research to understand how oxytocin works exactly and in whom. For oxytocin that you can get from a pharmacist, can that be useful for certain populations? Like for example, for people on the autism spectrum, is that useful? Perhaps. There's been a lot of mixed research on this. So there, there was a study done in 2016 where um, children with autism were given oxytocin for five weeks and then given placebo for five weeks. And they found that the parents reported increased or improved social behaviors under oxytocin. There's been various studies which have found similar results, but there's been other studies as well which have not found results. And a lot of it seems to depend on the types of measures people are using. And it's also important to understand that autism is a very heterogeneous. People with autism are very, very different. What may work for one individual may not necessarily work for another individual. I 
still wouldn't recommend now going to the pharmacy or getting a prescription if you want to um, boost social behaviours because we we just don't know if it works and how it works. And that's some of the so that's some of the research that we're doing at our lab at the University of Oslo. We're looking at different ways that oxytocin can actually impact on social behaviours and on, on repetitive behaviours, which is another characteristic of autism. And we're also doing a lot of brain imaging studies to actually find out what is actually going on in the brain. We almost need to take a step back to understand what's it actually doing before we can take two steps forward. Overall, this idea of the hug hormone or love hormone persists because we kind of want it to be a nice story. We want to believe that there is something within us that is as simple as this equals connection. This hormone is something which when we're having a positive experience, it is increased. Unfortunately, physiology is not that straightforward. Science is nuanced. Stories don't always have a clear beginning, middle and end. And the story of science is always evolving, which is what makes it so cool and interesting. Oxytocin plays a bunch of different roles in many of our behaviours which differ from person to person. We keep continuing to understand why, and that's okay. It's also okay to hug your partner or your dog just because it's nice and not necessarily for a hormone life hack. If you want to debunk even more brain myths, I recommend the course Brain Myths Exploded, lessons from neuroscience from Wondrium, who happen to be the sponsor of this video. Wondrium is where you can find the answer to everything you've ever wondered about. They have a curated collection of short videos, long videos, documentaries, how-tos and tutorials that are thoroughly researched and presented by experts. They used to be called The Great Courses Plus and now have rebranded to Wondria. I like them because I love learning new stuff and I suspect that you do too. For example, your brain is not divided into a creative side and an analytical side. The left-right brain thing is a myth. And this course shows you how the two hemispheres of your brain are interconnected. Wondrium are offering all Braincraft viewers a free trial please visit wondrium.com slash braincraft. You can click on the link in the description below to start your free trial today. Thanks.